Welcome to Disciple Science. I'm Dale Gentry. Today on the podcast, you're going to hear my conversation with Dr. Sandra Richter. She is an Old Testament Bible scholar who recently published a book called Stewards of Eden, in which she explores the relationship between the ancient Israelites and God's creation through the lens of the scriptures, especially spending some fascinating time going through the laws and what do the laws laid out by God help us understand about their view and their relationship with <clears throat> all that's been created. She also has interesting perspectives on the New Testament and applies all of it to modern day uh, situations and issues of uh, environmental stewardship. I really recommend it. It's very digestible and readable. It's a great place to start for a Sunday school group or a small group that wanted to explore this story of biblical views of humans and creation. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Sandra Richter. All right. Well, we are so fortunate to be joined today by Dr. Uh, by Dr. Sandra Richter, who is internationally known for her work on Deuteronomy. Uh, Dr. Richter brings the Old Testament to life by exploring the real people and real places from which it comes. She's a graduate of Valley Forge University, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, and earned her doctorate from the Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations Department of Harvard University in Hebrew Bible. A veteran of many years of leading student groups in archaeological excavation and historical geography classes in Israel, she also taught at Asbury Theological Seminary, at Wesley Biblical Seminary, and at Wheaton College. She's recognized among the laity for her book, The Epic of Eden, A Christian Entry into the Old Testament, which I'm just starting to read right now and enjoying, and is currently working on a second in that series, The Fifth Gospel, A Christian Entry into the Book of Isaiah, which I look forward to reading. She's also the author of several adult Bible curriculums with Seedbed. Dr. Richter, thank you so much for joining us today on the Disciple Science Podcast. It is great to be here. It's not often I get to be interviewed by a real biologist. <laughs> this, is, this is fun. <laughs> good, good. Well, it's fun for me too. I don't often get to interview uh, Bible scholars, so it's, it's a treat. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background and how you got into, um, you know, studying the Old Testament and, and maybe a little bit about your background and your interest in, in the environment and creation care as well. Hmm. Well, I got into uh, studying the Old Testament uh, really by becoming a Christian and mm -hmm. happened in my late teens. And mm -hmm. I had a radical life transforming experience. I I anticipate I wouldn't be here if mm. I hadn't had that experience, oh. uh, as well on my way to becoming a statistic. Um, I got dropped into a little Christian college, honestly, by mistake. Hmm. Um, and that's another story uh, yeah. we can address some other time. But I, uh, what drew me into um, a, a Christian college in the first place and what drew me into the study of the Bible is that somewhere along the way in my very early days as a believer, someone dropped the book, um, The Cross and the Switchblade, into my hands. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very old. It's yeah. a, a Dave Wilkerson's story of launching Teen Challenge in New York City in response to the heroin crisis. Mm -hmm. And I read this book. I was 17 years old. Uh, I had no exposure to the organized church. None. Wow. And uh, when I read this book, I couldn't sleep. Uh, the Holy Spirit just used it to grab my heart. I went to one of the leaders in my little home Bible study group where I'd, I'd landed as a new believer. And I told Mrs. Stamper, I said, um, I've read this book. I, I can't sleep at night. Mm. I have to find these people and I have to help them. What do I do? And her response was, well, Sandy, you are experiencing a call to ministry. And I said, oh, okay, what's that? And uh, then she explained and she went on to say, well, it means you need to go to Bible college. And I said, okay, what's that? And so she told me about two colleges. I applied to both, probably in crayon. Um, <laughs> I, and I, one of them lost my application. I wound up at Valley Forge. I spent all of my summers in college interning at the Philadelphia 
uh, Teen Challenge Women's Center in inner city Philly, changed my life, went into ministry, um, and just plugging along, trying to serve the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, in the midst of a ministry and a, and a denomination and an era that wasn't wild about women in leadership. Oh, uh, sure. Huh. Nor were they wild about academics because, yeah. you know, there's no sh more surefire way to kill your faith than going to cemetery. Uh, um, yeah. That would be the other word for seminary. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's so, too bad. All that to say, it was a little bit of, it was a little bit of a mismatch. Mm -hmm. And um, along the way, uh, God used a, a lot of different forces to redirect me toward the academy. Mm -hmm. and and so I just started dropping in on seminary classes, mostly to improve my skills as a pastor, because that's what I was doing at the time. And uh, all of these forces just kind of came together. My best gifts were in the classroom. My denomination wasn't wild about women in the pulpit. Um, and while I was at Gordon-Conwell uh, Theological Seminary, just God just redirected me toward the academy. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the Old Testament has always fascinated me. It's it's our backstory, right? right yeah, it, right. Who would ever start reading Harry Potter at book five? <laughs> How crazy is that? So I, I was determined to figure out where Sirius Black came from. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I'm I'm in the middle of Harry Potter book five right now. Uh, are you? Yeah, I, I have um I've got four young kids, and so mm -hmm. I'm reading it to my to my two middle aged kids, and so I am. Mm -hmm. That resonates. Uh, thanks for that reference. <laughs> mm -hmm. I did the same thing. I read every word to my yeah. kids. Yeah. So whatever. I wound up at Harvard University, uh, working on Hebrew Bible, and. Um, got a fabulous education, got yeah. all, got all of my questions answered, and then got about 10,000 more right. questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now that those are done, let's let's start with the yeah. rest of them. Yeah. yeah. So here I am. That's yeah. that's great. And, and and in your book, again, the book that we're talking about here, if we haven't made it explicit yet, this is this book called The Epic of Eden. I think this came out about a year ago. Is that right? Yeah, this one is Stewards of Eden. Or, sorry, Stewards of Eden. Yes, okay. thank you for correcting that. Stewards of Eden. And this is a book about uh, about um, really old Old Testament, but also actually New Testament as well. A, just a mm -hmm. biblical view on care for creation, and it's mm -hmm. clear that this is not just a uh, an intellectual curiosity for you, but that you are no. very emotionally connected to this. Tell us about your interest in in environmental issues. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Yeah. So uh, along the way, with this crazy journey of mine, I have always been deeply invested in creation. Um, mm -hmm. I heard God speak to me through mm -hmm. creation. Mm -hmm. I, uh, probably a major part of why I'm a Christian is what a theologian would call general revelation. Mm -hmm. When I stand in the middle of one of the border forests around Yosemite and all I can hear is the trees, um, yeah. I, it speaks to my soul. And yeah. I am constantly staggered by what the creator of the universe has given to us. Mm -hmm. Sure, as a biologist who is an expert in all of the things that are happening under the service, your amazement is bigger than mine. Mm -hmm. So I've always been in that position. I've always had a very high um, degree of empathy for the wild creature and uh, their struggles against our reckless destruction of their habitat. I've always been awed when I saw a peregrine falcon freeze in mm -hmm. the air before it drops for its prey. Always. Yeah. Yeah. But, when I, but when I became a Christian, and this is one of the stories I know that you were interested in, when I became a Christian, I thought, okay, well, that's really great stuff, but that's on the margins. Mm. What matters here is saving souls. What really matters is not raccoons and endangered creatures, but endangered humans. Mm -hmm. And I need to put that, that other love aside, and I, I have to do what really matters. And that was the posture with which I entered ministry. 
and I maintained that posture for a very long time, although I was always the person in the office who was starting the recycling program. <laughs> always the person <laughs> volunteering at the wildlife rescue program, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have kissed a chipmunk, to quote. <laughs> Um, that one on me yeah I, oh, birds, you, so. yeah <laughs> you need to go there yeah. so all of that was always inside of me and um it was at Asbury Theological Seminary so this is my first full-time professorial gig mm. I'm about five years in and uh, I tell the story in the book we annually had something what we called a king kingdom conference and let me shout out for Asbury it's one of those amazing seminaries that actually unifies intellectual training with real ministry training. Mm -hmm. Seminaries tend to fall on one side of the line or the right, other. Yeah. yeah, Asbury does both. So here we are with our kingdom conference where typically we're gonna pull in um, uh, humanitarian organizations, missionaries, uh, word made flesh, you know, these, these different groups that are rocking the world for Jesus um, all over the place. And the person who was in charge was our ethics professor, Christine Pohl. And she actually dared to propose that we deal with creation care and stewardship. And uh, I already had a reputation on campus that this was a significant issue to me. And she asked me if I would preach the conference. And uh, I was I was like, really? <laughs> really? I can stand in a pulpit and I can speak to creation care as a reflection of the character of our God. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Yeah. And so I think I prepared harder for that 20 minutes than I have for anything in my life. <laughs> as you and I both know, um, you can lose an audience in 30 seconds. Mm. And I so desperately didn't want to lose this audience. Mm -hmm. I had a great uh, relationship with our student body, with our faculty and our staff. I wasn't afraid of that. I was afraid of the off-putting of, you're not allowed to talk about this from the pulpit. So I did what a good uh, rhetorician ought to do, right? Mm -hmm. I knew I had to tag in to our shared value system if I was gonna get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And already my value system was there. So what I tagged into, of course, which was, what does the Bible have to say about this? Right. Put the Democrats aside, let's put the Republicans aside. Let's, let's put the economists aside. Let's put um, the radical uh, Greenpeace tree huggers aside. Let's put them all aside and let's ask the question, mm -hmm. what does the rule of faith and praxis have to say about this earth that has been entrusted to Adam. Yeah. So that's where we started. And by the grace of God, um, we brought the house down. Yeah. And it changed. It changed Asbury Theological Seminary. And it still changed. Yeah. I've been there for 10 years. Yeah. But the recycling program is still running strong. Um, there were many other players. I, you know, I certainly don't want to take the, the credit for th all of this, but it was the catalyst. Yeah. So that was the first time I was like, okay, we can do this. And that led to more speaking engagements. It led to a couple of publications. In 2008, I dared to propose to the Institute of Biblical Research, which is one of my professional guilds. Um, I was on the planning committee and they said, what do we do next year? Mm -hmm. Someone with something new. And I said, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, might we want to talk about this? And they were like, Ooh, that mm -hmm. would be very temporary, very pertinent, but none of us knows how to do that. So Sandy, will you be one of our plenary speakers? Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, it was me with Old Testament and the August Douglas Moo doing New Testament and oh, Doug. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another Doug's great book out. that's come out recently on creation care. Yeah. Yes. He he and his son yep. um, uh, put that out, and it's it's longer and and more detailed, and it, and it has uh, a written curriculum attached. I highly recommend it. Right. Um, so we tag teamed. Old and New Testament, and uh, IBR launched a section on environmental stewardship as a result. 
mm. that ran for five or so years and has just recently, you know, been, you know, it, it's kind of run its course. Um, but then, and you tell me when you want me to stop telling stories. Oh, no, this is great. Uh, there was the the juncture at Wheaton College, which I think would speak to your students in particular. Do yeah, yeah. Please do tell that story. If it's, I think we're on this the same page here. You, you um, detail in the first couple pages uh, mm -hmm. this new course that you proposed at Wheaton. I think that mm -hmm. was in, in the vein of of you know what is how does the Bible speak to to the environment and, and to mm -hmm. God's creation. And you got, um, well, you tell the story. What, what, how did your students respond when, when you asked them, why are you in this class? Okay. So by the time I got to Wheaton, I was thinking again that, okay, we can do this, you mm -hmm. know? And as I think you and I both know, when it comes to the church, in particular, the evangelical wing of the church, I, I, I think we're dealing with a sleeping giant, Mm -hmm. on this topic. Mm -hmm. And everything in me, both as an academic and as someone with the heart of a pastor, I want to awaken the sleeping giant. <laughs> and I want to awaken us to our calling on, on this, on, on this um, battlefront, if mm -hmm. we want to, with that language. So uh, when I got to Wheaton, um, I quickly met uh, Kristen Page, who is uh, the endowed chair of biology at, at college and uh, definitely kindred spirits and uh, committed to the same issues. Um, she is a biologist afraid to step into the realm of theology. Me as um, a biblical theology person afraid <laughs> to step on the biology end because, you know, we we make a mess of each other's disciplines on a right. regular Right. Yeah. Um, so we applied for something called a faith and learning grant, and it was awarded to us to launch this new class. And uh, of course, it's expensive for a university to let two faculty member teach a single class. So <laughs> with, there, there's always the politics and the money behind it. But we got the money. And Kristen and I launched this class entitled uh, the, the title changed a few times, but I, I think um, the final title was the, the Christian and Environmental Stewardship, the Bible and Biology. I think that's what we, wound, we landed on. And we launched the class. We were both a, little, we were both a lot nervous. And um, so we had the standard ice-breaking exercise. And every person listening to this podcast who's a teacher has used this ice-breaker uh, Sometimes, right? Everybody gets in the room. It's a class of about 20, 25. So it's small enough that you can say, okay, let's go around the room and have everyone introduce themselves, tell us your major, and why you decided to take this class. And the only thing that Chris and I were expecting from this was to build a little bit of community and, you know, to get people to start talking. That was all we expected. Was as we went around this room, student after student after student, they all gave the exact same rationale for why they wanted to take the course. Yeah. And it essentially went like this. Um, I'm a Christian. Uh, I've been a Christian since I was a four or I became a Christian last year. That was different. I have always loved uh, the environment. Uh, and sometimes they would say camping, bird watching, sailing, the Ozarks, you name it. I've always loved these things. I've always felt deeply connected to these expressions of God's character and his, and his actions. But I've never felt as a Christian that I was allowed to advocate for this love in the Christian arena. Yeah. All said the same thing. They all felt that their Christian faith somehow trumped their love for God's creation and they couldn't love both. Right, yeah. And when we got all the way around the room, I looked at Kristen and she looked at me and we said the same thing. That we as professionals felt that we were allowed to love both at the same time. Right. Wow. And uh, gosh, what, what's behind that? I mean, and this is, I can get off topic, but what's, what's behind that? Because I've experienced the same thing and wrestled with this. I have the same story. I was raised in church and kind of had this period in my 20s where church became not so important. 
And when I came back mm-hmm. to it, I didn't know how to put them back together because I was, mm-hmm. I was an ecologist and I loved nature, et cetera. And I didn't know if that would fit in with the Christian faith of my youth. What's mm-hmm. behind that tension that we, we believe that narrative? Mm-hmm. Well, I, first of all, I would love to hear from where you stand, what mm-hmm. the tension is. Um, I know where it is from where I stand, because mm-hmm. although I am, you know, I'm an endowed chair and I publish in Acadian and Northwest Semitic and <laughs> level three of Lakish at this point in time, um, I'm still very much involved in the life and the health of the church. And I hope that I always will be. So I, you know, I stand in pulpits on a regular basis, or at least in lecterns in front of congregations. And in where I stand, I, I think there are three big reasons for why the church struggles with this topic. And, or at least, um, again, the, the conservative end of the church, the high view of scripture end of the church. Yeah. And um, the first one I think is, is politics, and absolutely. And it's not just politics, it's American politics. Uh, a year ago at this time, I was over in London giving the Lang lecture at the London School of Theology, which was a tremendous privilege. And they wanted me to present on, uh, the title of the lecture was, Can a Christian Be an Environmentalist? Mm-hmm. All the Brits were like, why are you even asking that question? <laughs> Christian can be an environmentalist because they have a different political deal. To do. Yeah. So in American politics, as you know so well, uh, the traditional political allies of the church are not the traditional political allies of the environment. Right. As a result, the church is wound up on one end of the theological spectrum and environmental stewardship is wound up on the other end of the political spectrum. And uh, people in the church uh, have in my opinion, uh, associated evangelicalism with a political agenda that they cannot embrace. Yep. And therefore, stewardship of creation has become guilty by association. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm not naming the parties, but we all know what they are. Right, right, uh, sure. yeah. And, yeah, and so if you're gonna be a Christian, if you uh, support environmental concern, y- y- you also are- Yeah, there's a dichotomy, yeah. yeah. And, and so you can't be pro-life and pro-environment. You can't be a patriot and a conservationist. Um, you, yeah, you know where I'm going. So that's one big issue. And uh, what I launched the book with is, hey guys, uh, are you paying attention to whose kingdom you're actually a citizen of? Mm-hmm. And I think what we're watching on the news over the past six weeks uh, brings this into very sharp focus. Uh, where is your citizenry? Are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? Mm-hmm. Is your Lord and master the Lord Jesus Christ? Then although American politics can serve as a vehicle for being salt and light in this fallen world, these are not where our loyalties, are, our allegiances lie. Mm-hmm. So let's ask the question, what does, what does our Lord have to say? about environmentalism as opposed to a particular political party. Yeah. So that's question number one. I think the second issue has to do with many issues that uh, involve social action, social justice, again, mm-hmm. dangerous words to some of our constituencies. And that's that we, especially as Americans, uh, we don't see the impact of our environmental behavior. We don't see it. And that's on purpose. Uh, the mm-hmm. industry are involved are working very hard to make sure the the environmental impact of their behavior is invisible to Americans. So we don't see the impact of industrialized agriculture and its abuse of the land. We don't see the Ganges River system in full collapse. I mean, 10 years ago, the United Nations was saying that the Ganges River system may no longer be viable as a living system. Right, yeah, right. A A biologist, I mean, Oh my gosh, one of the most major estuaries on our planet is yeah, dead. Yep. Yeah, and this because Americans have exported our industry and we've exported environmentally uh, unsustainable industries to countries that don't care. Mm-hmm. And so it's their river systems that are collapsing instead of ours. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell stories in the book about dear friends who are working in Haiti who are watching an entire nation in free fall 
because of environmental degradation or sweet Danielle and Neil Karlstrom who have spent years in Madagascar walking alongside the Mag Malagasy people because these people are starving to death and one out of 10 women die trying to deliver a baby because of severe malnutrition due to the collapse of their environment. Why is their environment collapsing? Predatory industry. But we don't see it because we live in a country that protects ourselves from this. So I give case study after case study to bring it into focus. So we don't see it is the second one. If we did see it, I, I know who's listening to this podcast. If we watched those babies dying, we would do something about yeah. it because that's who the church is. Um, and then I think the third thing is that the church has been taught and poorly taught that the earth is disposable and that it's all going to burn up in the end. So kind of like you and I and our young faith, well, since the earth is going to burn up, we might use its resources as aggressively as possible to bring about what really matters, and that is the salvation of souls. But that's not actually what the New Testament teaches. Mm. Um, so I deal with all three of those issues as I walk through the books, um, through the book, and I, I do think they are the cause of much of this binary um, uh, dichotomy that, that you and I have both experienced in loving God and loving the environment at the same yeah. time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and I, I agree. I, I love your your metaphor of a sleeping giant because mm. it, you do hear these stories of, of churches or, or colleges or just little ministry here and there that will kind of catch a bug for the role of creation care, not only in just you know worshiping God, but serving your neighbor. And it just explodes. Mm. It's, the, it's like a light comes on. That, and so I I, um, I I think that those those reasons why it's caused problems in the past are, we can all see it. They're not, they're not inherent, they're constructed. And so we mm. just better communicate how to get, get past those. So th thank you for addressing those. Uh, let's, yeah, and, let's... and, and let me just a, a tag on to there. There are a lot of folk out there who are working very hard to show the link between environmental degradation right. and the widow and the orphan. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I just, I just want to speak on behalf of the church for a moment. We are, the organization that has founded more hospitals, more orphanages, more relief organizations, yep. any other single institution on this planet, because we know what our calling is. Yep. What we don't see is, is the connection. Right. That's what we're saying. Yeah. Right. Well, let, let's start to get into the Bible then, because th this, okay. is, uh, this is an idea that's, that's uh, caused some struggle throughout the years, and, and mm -hmm. you probably know better than I do. Um, but let's start in the beginning, right? So in Genesis mm -hmm. 1, it talks about dominion. What, why has that mm -hmm. term caused so much um, hand-wringing about, about what it, <laughs> the implications about, of, of, for what it means for how we live and, and how much yeah. freedom we have to, to do as we please? Yeah. And um, so I'm going to have a, a multi-layered answer to this. And okay. I, I hope I, I give <clears throat> an adequate multi-layered answer in the book as well. And let me say too about the book, the book is intentionally short. Um, yeah. And so there are a lot of questions it doesn't get to. And the reason it's intentionally short is, is my ambition was that it would be a tract of sorts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, brief, readable, and something that my students can hand off to their parents and their parents can hand off to their grandparents. Right. Yeah. And everybody would be able to see in these pages, okay, that's my Bible. And if that's my Bible, I need to listen. So right. um, all that to say, okay, when we deal with the issue of dominion, uh, one of the things I deal with extensively is uh, Genesis chapter one, which of course is the famous uh, creation week yeah. that words uh, how, when, why uh, God creates as he does. And I would uh, characterize Genesis 1 as the um, multi-layered introduction to not only Genesis, but to the Pentateuch as a whole. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate uh, questions that Genesis 1 is trying to answer is who's in charge here? What is God's relationship to humanity? And what is humanity's relationship to the planet? Mm -hmm. And I think 
those are the big questions that are being answered in Genesis 1. And I, I often challenge my undergrads um, and do it in hopefully a fun and comical way that, you know, if we actually believe that the Pentateuch was written by Moses, and if we actually believe that Genesis 1 is Moses' introduction to his magna opus, you know, let's go as conservative as we can on our view of authorship of the book of Moses, of, of well, it is the book of Moses on the Torah. <laughs> Do we actually think that Moses is standing on the side of Mount Sinai, looking down at the motley crew at the base of the mountain? Mm. I like to call them polytheists considering monotheism. You know, Do we actually think that, that what's on his mind is the fossil record? <laughs> really what he's worried about is, is Moses up there wringing his hands over dinosaurs? You know, I, I think more than likely, Moses is up there concerned about introducing the people at the foot of the mountain to who their God is. Yeah, yeah. Because they don't know who he is. What is his name? Who is this guy? Okay, so um, I think what's going on in this first week is there is a, a very specific structure being communicated. There's a lot going on in this first week, but this structure is essential. And what it's communicating um, in... And by the way, I didn't think this up. Um, Augustine thought this up about 300 <laughs> BC. And um, my mentor at Gordon Conwell, Meredith Klein, um, if anyone listening to you is reformed, they know the name of Meredith Klein. He taught it to me. Um, so we look at the structure of the week and we see that days one, two, and three are creating habitats, right? Mm -hmm. so we get um, the day and night in day one. Um, we get uh, the heavens and the oceans in day two, and we get the dry land in day three. Mm -hmm. As we circle back, we see in day four, we get the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. This is where we start bumping into language of a dominion and rulership. Yeah. And we see in day five, which parallels day two, that the birds are given to fill and have, uh, inhabit the skies and the fish are offered to fill and inhabit the seas. And then when we get to day um, 6A, we see that land animals are being uh, created to fill the dry land. Then we get to the climax of the poem and anybody can see the climax of the poem because we go from a very succinct and rhythmic structure to da, da, da. <laughs> And, and that is, of course, the creation of humanity. And the creation of humanity is male and female. They're made in his image. They are animated by his hand. They are a reflection of his, uh, reflection of his deity on earth. And they are being offered uh, dominion over everything that's gone before. So just as the birds and the fish rule the skies and the sea, humanity is supposed to rule the birds and the fish as the fish rule the sky and the sea. So we see this ascending authority. And of course, the week is not done until we hit day seven. And day seven is, um, you know, I'm not going to sing for you again, but it is the climax of climaxes. It is the uh, crescendo of crescendos. And it is this moment when the creator of the universe uh, seats himself upon his throne. He rests and uh, the word Shabbat, which is to rest, is, in my opinion, a wordplay with Shevet, which is the infinitive construct of to be enthroned. Um, and just like David in 1 Samuel, when he saw that all of his enemies were conquered, he rested, he sat upon his throne, and he surveyed his kingdom. This is what's happening on day seven. Um, creator of the universe, the sovereign Lord, sits upon his throne looks at all the amazing work he has done and says, it's good, mm. good. Yeah. So there is a dominion question built in to Genesis one. And without seeing that, uh, you're gonna miss the dominion that's being offered to humanity. So even the brief assessment I've just offered, if I ask the question, who is actually in charge right. of creation? Everyone listening would say Yahweh Elohim, mm -hmm. the universe. He's in charge. Who is his steward, his right-hand man, his vizier? Obviously, humanity. Yeah. have been given both male and female dominion over this planet. Who's in charge of 
uh, of everything that's come before, it is humanity. But as sub rulers under humanity, the birds have got the sky, the fish have got the sea, the land animals have got the land, and the sun, moon, and stars have got the cosmos. Okay. Everything's perfect, and you as a biologist will love this. You know, the ecosphere, um, the cycle of life, it, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. Everything has its place. Everything's operating. We've got a smooth running machine here. So this is the dominion, and I don't shy away from this word. This is the dominion that's been given to humanity. But humanity has not been given this dominion in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Humanity has been given this dominion, and now we'll step into a new metaphor, as a, as a vassal under his suzerain lord. Mm -hmm. yep. Let me hold off on that one. Let me go back to steward under king. Or let me go back even to renter under landlord. Humanity yeah, you, has given, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, you you do a great, you talk about um, Eden and Canaan as, as land grants. And I thought that yeah. was a really... A uh, helpful perspective, helpful metaphor. Uh, yeah, go on. Elaborate. Yeah, and and let me tell you that this is not a unique idea. I, yeah. I am not. This is not special. Right, right. Yeah. You can't get through an intro to Old Testament class without hearing about suzerains and vassals because it's all over the Bible. <laughs> um, the whole idea of covenant, right? Like the old covenant and the new covenant that we call the Old Testament and the right. new. This language emerges from the relationship between a suzerain, who is the big king, and a vassal, who's the little king, yeah. which would be equivalent in perhaps uh, more familiar language to your audience, um, a king and his steward, mm. or a king and his vizier, yeah. or even more familiar to all of our college students, a landlord and his renter. <laughs> <laughs> all of our college students. Together. <laughs> yeah, now it's coming together. And as all our students know, and most have learned the hard way, if they trash that apartment when it's all over, they lose the yeah. security deposit, right? Yeah. Because it never actually belonged to them anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's the relationship that's being communicated in Genesis 1. And it's being communicated throughout the Mosaic Law Code. And it's being communicated in the New Covenant as well that the creator actually owns this stuff. Mm. And what humanity is being charged to do is because his sovereign Lord loves him, and that's us, okay? So humanity, ha Adam, we're all the same thing. Um, because he loves us, he's giving us this amazing playground, right? That we have been charged to bring to its full fruition, to make it beautiful, to um, bring it to its ultimate expression, but to do so always under the sovereign authority of the creator. That's the seventh day. Yep. And so for the steward who stands at the sixth day to step away from the seventh day, well, that's what happened at the fall. That's what the fall is all about. Mm -hmm. That moment when Adam and Eve said, well, that's a really nice plan, but we would <laughs> like full autonomy. Yeah. We don't partial autonomy. We want full autonomy. Mm -hmm. And the creator of the universe with tears in his eyes says to them, if I stop you from making that choice, I will stop you from being human. I will stop you from being fully created in my image. So I have to let you make that choice. But the choice that you're making right now is going to destroy not only you, but everything I've placed under your care. And this, this is where the gospel comes into creation care. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. I, I, because, uh, uh, yeah, our job as the redeemed community, of course, is to stand against those realities. Yes. Go ahead. Get that plan back on track, right? I, I know mm -hmm. um, N.T. Wright has been so so helpful for me in, in, mm -hmm. in helping me understand that the gospel that I was presented with in my youth, you know, starts in in at the fall, right? Mm -hmm. What about the first two chapters of Genesis? That the, mm -hmm. the, to talk about getting the whole project back on track, not just solving our own fallenness, but the, the right. fallenness of all creation. That's just, that, that's, I love that. And um, I, t I tell my students all the time, this isn't all just about your personal fire insurance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yep. yeah, God is trying to redeem a planet here, yeah. not just a planet. Actually, he's redeeming a cosmos. Right. Yeah. One of my, one of my pet theories, which, you know, this is, this is me, not the Holy Spirit. And you can, you can tell me what, what you think. 
<laughs> is that one of the reasons we have an ever expanding universe is that the God who created us with insatiable curiosities never wanted us to get bored. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I like that idea. You know, I, I think it does, astronomy is so far out of my um, realm of expertise. I, I, you couldn't be further out there, but there's, there's something about the mystery that's out there that is almost comforting that we'll never fully grasp it. Um, mm, and, yeah. and, and that, and that our curiosity will never be satiated. And and there's something mm. delightful about that for some reason, you know, it'd be almost frustrating to think we could have all the answers someday, but yeah. know, that, that we're getting off track, yeah. but I, I, I yeah. love but back to your core issue. Yes, we have dominion. I've, I, I don't question that, Yeah. but we have dominion under responsibility and mm -hmm. we are called to exercise our dominion. According to the master plan, yeah. we are called to exercise our dominion the way he would exercise his dominion. So when we start looking at our Bibles, really we, what we want to ask is the question is, okay, how does God look at creation? How does God treat creation? What are the law codes of Israel that speak to his concern for uh, sustainable land use, his concern for humane animal husbandry, his concern for the wild creature and habitat, the widow and the orphan, environmental terrorism, and, and just like every other, um, every other exercise in the Christian life, what I'm after is conforming my character to his character. Right. Yeah. And let's get into that because I think um, I, I hear often people say, well, you know, dominion and stewardship and it's on the first two pages of the Bible, but it doesn't really talk much about it beyond that. And you do an amazing job oh. of showing how it is woven into so many other passages. So mm -hmm. let's start um, perhaps in, in Deuteronomy, which I know is, is your wheelhouse, and, mm -hmm. and some of the, the laws and the Torah. What, how do those laws speak to Israel being set apart in their relationship with creation? Hmm. Well, I think the first thing is what you've already mentioned, that Canaan itself is a land grant. And mm -hmm. again, bumping into the Susan Vassal relationship where the big king hands off land to the little king and says, okay, your nation can live in this land as long as you're faithful to me. And if you keep my stipulations, if you keep the covenant, then you keep the land. And that's what's going on in the Mosaic covenant. And for your, if they haven't read Epic of Eden, it's in there. Okay. So uh, the land grant idea I would say is what's happening in the garden. God gives the garden to Adam and Eve and says, under my authority, this is all yours, but make sure you keep the stipulations of the covenant. Of course, Adam and Eve don't, and they wind up uh, exiled from the garden. Israel is um, a reboot. Let's try this again. God gives them a land grant, and God says to them, as long as you keep the stipulations of the covenant, you keep the land. They didn't, and so what happens? They're exiled from the land. Um, and we can get into the New Testament in a minute, but with that idea of the land grant, there is this essential idea that the land ultimately will never belong to Israel. That is all over the Old Testament covenants. The land will never truly belong to Israel. The land always belongs to Yahweh. And in light of that, Yahweh hands it out of the conquest. He says, okay, Judah, you get this section. Issachar, you get this section. Reuben, you get this section. Don't mess with anybody else's land. So he hands it out. Then he goes on to say, all right, and this is going to how you're going to use the land. Ready? Mm -hmm. um, you farm. Uh, every seven years, you're going to give your fields um, a fallow. And you're a biologist. You know what happens to soil if it never gets a break. Yeah. Um, soil has to uh, have the opportunity to renovate itself. It needs bugs. It needs worms. It needs It needs um, uh, yeah. the temper of old crop um, yeah. remain uh, uh, being chopped up inside of it. So that's what fallow accomplishes. Um, the other thing fallow accomplishes is it tells all the bugs who've been hanging out there for six years, um, move on, dude, because they're not growing strawberries again here this year. <laughs> and of course, that's, that's great too. So they're instructed to let the land lie fallow. And God is super serious about this. There's law after law after law. And in fact, when the exile finally comes through, God announces to Israel, I'm taking 70 years from you because you didn't let the, you didn't let the land lie fallow. Hmm. So 
I'm going to let it lie fallow. So the fact that they are driven out in a military conquest is partly blamed on the fact that they didn't practice sustainable agriculture. <laughs> yeah, go team. So we've got sustainable agriculture. That's all over the place. We've got um, humane animal husbandry. Yeah. Israel was not allowed to abuse their animals. Now, everyone listening to your podcast is saying, I would never abuse an animal. My dog sleeps in the middle of my bed. <laughs> I, you know, I wind up sleeping on the floor to make sure that they're comfortable. Uh, but what the people listening to your podcast don't know is what's happening in industrial agriculture. Mm. They don't know that 95% of the animals that come to them saran wrapped on styrofoam in their local grocery store have been tortured beyond belief. They don't know. They will find out when they read my book. Yeah. They will right. find out if they, you know, read Matthew Scully or, you know, so many of the other things. They don't know that it is illegal in this country to take a picture of a slaughter plant. They don't know that if you stop on the side of a public highway and turn your cell phone on and videotape a, a slaughter plant that's behind barbed wire on the side of the road, that you might have seven cop cars show up in the next three minutes. I, that story blew me away. I couldn't believe that. I mean, yeah. actually, I can believe it, but I'm. It's so disturbing, you know. It's. Um, I know. Yeah. I know. This. These are. And this is a. And this gets to a bigger question, right? And I don't want to get too too off track. Mm -hmm. but yeah. When 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 I'm talking and they people say what what can we do what can we do mm -hmm. and you know and when they want to hear change your light bulbs and they want to hear mm -hmm. you know, recycle more often which are things we should do mm -hmm. we also need to talk about the systems that are yeah. that are you know these are almost the, the principalities and powers that yes. are um, serving this um, just disharmony Industry. with mm -hmm. with creation and unfortunately and I have, you know, I grew up in a, in a farming community, mm -hmm. uh, or at least in the context of one, and, and mm -hmm. I love the farmers dearly, but, but a, a lot of, we allow too much uh, of that. That's just not, it's not ethical, uh, I fear. And so, yeah. Well, and I would say, um, I, I would say I've talked to a lot of farmers too. Mm -hmm. In fact, one time I presented on humane animal husbandry in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Your brain. Yeah, you, you could have heard a pin drop. Okay. <laughs> but here's the deal. Real, real farmers don't treat their animals this way. Yeah, right. Real, real farmers have been forced by the systemic injustice that you speak of into spaces where they can't survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the only way they can survive is by selling out their land and their barns to Tyson and to, um, um, who's the pork industry? Smithfield, there oh, it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they are therefore required to raise their animals in the fashion that these corporations are demanding. And it's the only way they can survive, it's the only way they can pay their bills, and they are being, um, phased out of existence right along yeah. with, you know, old McDonald's farm where you actually can see a live animal in a field. Mm -hmm. And your listeners are, are like, what is she talking about? And we don't have time to cover all of this. Right. Yeah. Read the book. So one of the key stories in the book is um, a dairy farmer who wrote to, I think it was the Washington Post, and the New York Times. I don't have the details in front of me right now and told his story of how his dairy farm has been in his family since the very early 1900s. They survived two or three market crashes, mm. industrial agriculture, he finally had to sell it out. Yeah. And what, what he's saying is farmers can't survive in the United States of America anymore, only corporations can. And what you will find as you read through this book as these um, corporate farms, Tyson, Smithfield, they, they are not staffed by farmers. They're staffed largely by illegal immigrants mm -hmm. who are afraid to speak up. They have 100% annual turnover. Water plants, more than 100% annual turnover because the situation is so outrageous. And the 
livestock. Oh my gosh. What? <laughs> Read the book. You will not, uh, you won't be able to sleep. And right. yes, there is systemic injustice here. Yep. Yep. We're talking about systemic injustice all over our country right now. There are principalities, there are powers. Let me tell you that Europe has fought back. Let me tell you that gestation crates and um, uh, confinement uh, battery cages, they're illegal in Europe and in Britain. They don't do it. Um, and so their farmers, they earn a middle-class income which means their food is more expensive, but they are, um, they are living a much more sustainable type of agriculture and they're taking care of their people. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, and, and uh, in case people are confused, you know, what do you mean read the book? This is, isn't this a book about Bible? You, you do a great job of, of, of laying down the, the biblical um, framework and mm. then elaborate case studies of, of modern context and it really is well done and I agree read the book it, you, you'll be you'll be impressed by the by the applications of, of these supposedly uh, old covenant stories that don't matter to us anymore and how they mm -hmm. come, come to life for us today so it, it really is well done let's, um, let's and let me let me give you an example of one of those biblical issues in case yeah. I've, I've lost someone um, you know throughout the Old Testament there's also <laughs> laws about a wise man is kind to his beast there um you know there's lots of proverbs lots of psalms lots of uh, this is a posture of uh treating your animals well but what most of your audience won't realize is that israel actually was a subsistence economy and subsistence means that these people are barely making it and we have managed to quantify via archaeology that uh they often are not making it. In fact, uh, the hungry season, which is a term that any anthropologist knows, that's the season between when last year's harvest has been used up yeah. and uh, this year's harvest has not yet come in. The hungry season in Israel was approximately 60 days for the average mm -hmm. family. So mm -hmm. think about that for just a moment as the average uh, American householder, you know you're looking at 60 days where you can't put, enough, you can't put any food on your table. So what you do, you're going to compromise your, your food sources throughout the year, go a little bit hungry all year, you might hunt, you might try to take an extra animal out of the flock, but you're always fighting this reality that there's never enough. Yeah. In the midst of that, there's never enough. One of the laws I highlight is this lovely little law about not muzzling the ox while he threshes the grain. Mm -hmm. You've never thought twice about that law, right. except be if you've seen it in the New Testament and Paul picks it up to say, make sure you feed your pastors. And he sort of deploys it as a metaphor. Well, we, I did um, a big study with a past student who is a, a lifer cattle rancher out in West Texas. And we actually figured out how much grain a working bovine can consume in the course of two, three, four days of threshing. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it was tons of fun. <laughs> yeah. And um, did the zoo archaeology work to figure out how big the bovines were back then and this, that, and the other thing. So what we came up with is that um, a working bovine could probably take out about seven quarts of grain a day without foundering. And that means getting a life-threatening bellyache, right? Yeah. You know, go from grass-fed to grain-fed overnight. You're going to, it's too hot. Um, so about seven quarts. So now think about the fact that that bovine is threshing your grain for three, four days. Yep. So you're up in the 20s, 30s quarts. Now think about the fact that you know your kids are going to go hungry for 60 days come next winter. Yep. And yet Yahweh says, let that animal enjoy its life and work. Let him celebrate the harvest right along with you. Don't you dare make him go hungry while he's working for you. Right. This, is, this is 1200 BC we're talking about. Yeah. This is not Greenpeace, you yeah. know? This is not the Humane Society. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so well said. It's so, and, and that's, um, that's what I so appreciated about your book is that these passages of scripture that are kind of easy to flip through when you're going through your yearly plan and you're going through the laws and you're like, yada, yada, yada. They have, they're so profound if you, if you dig into the details. And that's a great example of that. So um, 
before before we go, if we can t talk about one more thing, uh, and you alluded to this, what what about the New Testament? Isn't the New Testament mm. silent on creation care? What 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 do we find in the New Testament about about this message? Well, arguably, we find a lot less about creation care in the New Testament than we do in the Old Testament, yeah. and a lot of that has to well, one New Testament's a heck of a lot shorter. As I remind my New Testament colleagues all the time, I get. <laughs> you get a semester. I have twice as much material. <laughs> okay, so it is a lot shorter. Um, it only uh, encompasses about 70 years. Um, and uh, the audience is much more urban. Like we, we have farmers and, and um, pastoralists and all that sort of thing like we do. So the focus is a lot different. And the focus in the new covenant is all about, let me introduce you to the new Adam. You know, let me introduce you to uh, the uber human and what he's doing for humanity. But even in the midst of that, we hear all of the language about dominion. We hear all of the language about the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. We hear about um, how all of the cosmos still belongs to um, the second Adam and he has named us as his heirs. So all of that is still in there. Um, there are a few uh, passages that are either really need attention or really problematic. So very quick, the really problematic ones are the ones that deal with a concept known as the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Christians call it the second coming. Uh, the day of the Lord goes all the way back to Genesis 3. It's not a new concept. The idea is that uh, Yahweh created this world. He owns this world. And after the fall, at some point in time, he's going to split the skies and he's coming back and he's getting his own. Okay, so that will be the day of great judgment, the day of great mercy, the day of the deliverance of those who believe, and the day of um, accountability for those who don't, right? Mm -hmm. The second coming is the day of Yahweh. It's all over the Bible. Okay, that day is always described with apocalyptic language, a technical term that um, has to do with a lot of symbolic biblical language about fire, um, massive destruction, signs in the earth uh, and the sky. The sun is darkened, the moon goes red, um, fire and disaster. You will see that language all over your Bible. When that language moves into the New Testament, people who aren't familiar with apocalyptic language look at that and they say, see, the earth is all gonna burn. Right. Why should I bother? So mm -hmm. I do out with the day of Yahweh in the book. But let me contrast the day of Yahweh with the um, Apostle Paul, who, of course, is our great theological um, hero. And somehow or another, I don't think he was worried about eating organic. Just get it. it doesn't seem to be in his profile. So I'm just going to read it for you. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, uh, which is critically important because he's talking about the resurrection of you and I when the plan, the great plan finally comes to fruition, which is what we're all living for, right? So Paul is comforting the people in Rome and he says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This is the end of the plan. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, better frustration. Yeah not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Mm -hmm. Only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, comma, the redemption of our bodies. Yeah. All is saying, and very powerfully, is that your salvation and mine is not finished until our bodies are resurrected from the dead. When our material selves are resurrected into eternal life, to be rejoined with our immaterial selves, which have already been resurrected and are awaiting the final day. And when these two are rejoined, hallelujah, that's the day. That is when um, the fall is reversed. That is when the curse is broken. That This is the day we're living for. Mm -hmm. Paul is comparing that moment with the resurrection of creation. He's saying that the resurrection of my body 
is essentially the same as the resurrection of creation. Yeah. Creation itself is longing, suffering, groaning, anxiously awaiting that moment because it too will be resurrected. Right. So if I'm going to trash creation because it's going to burn, then logic would demand that I should trash my body. Right, exactly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and even perhaps more pointed, I should also trash the unsaved widow and orphan because they're going to burn. Mm -hmm. That is not the posture of the creator. Yeah. Yes. And yes. so in some, this earth is not disposable. This earth is God's good creation. His intention is to redeem it and to resurrect it, just like he intends to redeem and resurrect us. And our job has not changed since the dawn of time. Yeah. My job is to steward it. And just like those efforts toward every other act of faithful living in this fallen world are going to be frustrated, mm. principalities and powers and unjust systems. And I accept that, but I don't give up because I'm a child of God. Mm -hmm. So too, my efforts toward stewarding and protecting this creation are going to be frustrated and um, intercepted and undermined but I can't stop doing it yeah. because of the character of my God. Yeah, that's so well said. Letting, giving me my preaching moment. Yes, I, I almost said it. I said preach, you're, you're on fire there. It was so good. <laughs> well, th thank you, Sandra, for coming on. This is really a, a treat to be able to speak with you. The, the book is, is um, again, it's, it's short and it's uh, readable by anybody and it's so profound at the same time and, and should be shared uh, widely. So it's, Stewards of Eden, uh, read it and, and pass it around to everybody at your church and you'll have a whole new view of, of the, the view for and, and, and the plan for creation and mm. its ultimate fate and, and how we should relate to it as, as followers of Jesus. So thank you uh, for writing it and for coming on. I hope that we're able to have you on again at some point in the future because we've got lots more topics that I think you could speak into. So. <laughs> Well, Dale, I've loved being here. Thank you for sharing your audience with me and, and thank you for caring. Yep. Yeah. And, yep. and before we let you go, um, uh, where, where can we find you and, and what are you working on? Mm. What, what, what should we look for in the future? Well, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not terribly skilled with social media. So <laughs> uh, I, I am, with the help of my 17-year-old daughter, learning how to Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, the best place to find me is probably my faculty page at Westmont College. Great. Great. Um, and I do put my speaking engagements up every year. Of course, with COVID, they change by the hour. Sure. Um, I, um, how else can you find me? Um, I, my email is on my faculty page. I answer as many questions as I can. Uh, just I just did a webinar with Jerusalem University College on environmentalism, which is fun because, of course, oh, they on historical geography and archaeology. Right. Um, I what what are the big gigs coming up? Uh, <laughs> my, they're they're escaping me, but That's I'm not right. find. And usually people advertise, so if you can't find me through me, you can find me through them. Yep. Right now, I am on sabbatical and I'm writing my commentary on Deuteronomy. Oh, so. wonderful. Well, enjoy your, it's a nice time to be on sabbatical during COVID, so you don't have it to is. wrestle with all yeah. that. Well, in, enjoy it. Hopefully, we'll be back to some some version of normal in the in the summer. Um, and uh, again, just such a delight to have you on. Thanks for your time. Oh, wait, I do have one more thing. Yeah. Okay, so Seminary Now, I don't know if you've heard of them. Oh, yeah. They're a new online-based um, seminary program, and they're at the front of the, the pack here, cutting edge. We filmed a curriculum for the book uh, back in October. Okay. It should be coming out soon. Okay. So, oh, wonderful. Yeah. I'll see and, if uh, link to that, and we'll put it, on the, put it in the show notes. Yeah. Um, and um, I, will, I will email you, too, because they'll be thrilled. Great. Great. That's wonderful. Well, okay. thanks again for your time. We look forward to having you back at some point in the future. Uh, 